Grüß Sie from Salzburg, Austria. Welcome to Opus 17 of Classical Cake, the podcast where we discuss topics relating to Viennese classical music and Austrian culture while enjoying one of Vienna's delicious cakes. I'm your host, Daniel Adam Maltz. As a child prodigy, Mozart was known for, quote, interpreting the greatest maestro's most difficult sonatas and concertos on the harpsichord with great clarity, inexpressible lightness, skill, and style. It was a source of wonder to many. But I'm not talking about Wolfgang. That quote was about his older sister, Maria Anna Mozart. Nonnerl, as she was affectionately called, faded from history. But why? My guest today is Dr. Eva Neumeyer, the chairwoman of the Maria Anna Mozart Society. She is a musicologist who heads the music collection archives of the Archdiocese of Salzburg and also works with the Mozarteum Foundation. Dr. Neumeyer, thank you for joining me. Thank you for asking me. <laughs> Our cake today is Nuss Torta. The inside has nutty rum filling with layers of vanilla cream and sponge cake. Outside, marzipan fondant is topped with a chocolate drizzle, walnuts, and red currants. So, let's dig in. And it's not too early for cake, right? <laughs> no? <laughs> As we are in Salzburg. <laughs> Anyhow. <laughs> Very good. So, Nonnerl showed music talent early. Who taught her the harpsichord? Well, first of all, I'd like you not to use her nickname, Nannerl, uh, because we are not related to her, obviously, and it was a name used in the family. So she later on, and she grew up, of course, and was no child anymore, and she always signed with Marie Anne Mozart or Marie Anne von Berthold zu Sonnenburg later on when she mm. was married. Um, she was taught the harpsichord by Leopold Mozart, her father, and he started uh, her on the harpsichord uh, with eight years, when she was eight years okay. old, uh, which was actually pretty early for that time because the Bach family started with their children with ten. It's interesting to see how... Well, our approach to different things changes throughout history, yeah. like eight being uh, considered very late now. Very late now. Yeah, and very and late. even people trying to say that it's almost too late to start, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but uh, it wasn't always the case throughout yeah, history. It was not. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what was the relationship like between Maria Anna and Mozart as children? They were very close. Um, uh, Mozart showed very great talent very early, as mm -hmm. we know. And um, he he was very interested in the harpsichord, and so he started playing very early. From uh, the book Maria Anna had gotten from her father to learn different pieces. And uh, this book is so important because his earliest pieces are noted in there. But mm -hmm. it was actually Marie Anne's uh, notebook. And uh, I was able to read that uh, Wolfgang really idolized his sister. Well, she was the big sister. Mm -hmm. That's what little brothers do. And she <laughs> was a very gifted pianist also. Mm -hmm. um, in the beginning, she was the better pianist, of <laughs> course. Yeah. Yeah. So the siblings, which were mentioned, you know, uh, quite talented very early on. And the father, Leopold, embarked on a European tour. And also the mother. And also the mother. Yeah, yeah, Maria Anna Perto, who, uh, whose birthday is 300 years oh, this year. Really? Yeah, There's a lot going on this year, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good. So could you tell us more about this time of their tours around Europe? Um, well, they started uh, in June of 1763. And uh, this tour lasted uh, three and a half years, so a long, long tour. Of course, one traveled a lot slower yeah. at that time. Um, well, they went all over. They went to Paris uh, and stayed a while. They went to the Netherlands. They stayed in, in London for 15 months. Mm -hmm. um, they, on the tour back, they went to Switzerland. So it was quite a long way. And <laughs> I mean, Leopold Mozart was a very gifted uh, organizer. Yeah. 
among other things. <laughs> um, and well, he did did a very good job <laughs> in educating his children, but also presenting them. But their yeah. concerts were very well received. All yes, over. very. It was also the time of the child prodigies. Yeah, there's a, a report from one of. A quote from uh, talking about Maria Anna's playing, saying his daughter, Leopold's daughter, 11 years of age, plays the harpsichord marvelously and performs the longest and most difficult pieces with impressive precision. Mm -hmm. So clearly they made a good impact. Yes, and uh, she was one of the first uh, European pianists um, playing concerts all over. Yeah. So that was something very new. And special, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So... She stopped touring when she was 18, and Wolfgang kept going. Uh -huh. So why caused her to stop traveling? Well, um, she even stopped earlier. She mm. stopped with around 16, and then the family stayed home a little, and then uh, the first Italian tours came, where father and son went without mother and uh, sister. Um, this, of course, has, on the one hand, economic reasons, because traveling was very expensive. Um, it also has the reason of um, Leopold Mozart didn't want his daughter to be a traveling artist. In society, it was not seen, um, it was not seen as positive for Clearly a woman the, at that time. Clearly, the connotation and the expectations were different Yes, for Wolfgang for, and for Mariana. Definitely, and Wolfgang, of course, um, had this compositional talent that evolved, that erupted, kind yeah. of. And um, that was different from Maria Anna, uh, because she, she was a gifted pianist, a gifted musician, but she never saw herself as a composer, I believe. Mm. Next to her brother, she just decided... I don't do that, <laughs> and I play the piano. Yeah. So, which was smart. Yeah. So, we talked about this the society not having the same expectations for her because she was a woman, but it was mm -hmm. also to somewhat because um, she was becoming closer to a marriageable age. Is this... That's definitely. So, yeah. uh, she, she grew up, and uh, as an adult woman, it was not so easy to go around right. and uh, play. Yeah. Because that would make her a professional musician, earning her money with music. And that's what what was not um, received well in society. Mm -hmm. That w would diminish her chances to marry somebody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as you mentioned, she stopped touring early on as she was reaching, you know, getting older and reaching a marriageable age. But she actually waited to get married until she was 33. That was not un unusual at that mm -hmm. time. Um, at that time, only 20% of the people were married at all mm. because you had to have enough money, somebody had to come along to <laughs> ask you, and so on. Uh, so there was a very high percentage of the population uh, who didn't marry at all, and a lot of musicians' daughters never found anybody to marry. Mm. Uh, so, Maria Anna was, with her marriage, she really married up. Mm. And she, she, she was well provided for then. And uh, so, she really did well okay. in life. There's the story of before she eventually did get married, of she actually wanted to marry another person who yeah, Leopold Franz did not approve Armand of. Dippold. Okay. Um, he, uh, he was a friend of the family, and he uh, appears in the letters so around 1783, mm -hmm. and uh, they they get very close, yeah. but there's no evidence at all that Leopold did not approve of him. Oh, really? Not at all. So, and uh, Franz Armand Dippold also visited Leopold when he was ill later on, and he was very, he visited Nan, Maria Anna's uh, little son who grew up with Leopold. 
Mm-hmm. And Maria Anna sent him greetings all the time. So I don't believe at all that Leopold was the reason those two didn't work out. I, I mean, Wolfgang even wrote to her, she sh- sh- they should both go to Vienna um, and make a living there. But Franz Armand Leopold was a high official. Did she continue playing music in adulthood? Yes, she definitely did. Um when she married in uh, she married in 1784 and went to St. Gilden, which is about 30 kilometer, kilometers from Salzburg, mm-hmm. is of course a little village. And but we know that she continued to practice the piano three hours yeah. per day. So that's a long time for the the 18th century. Mm-hmm. And considering she had five stepkids and three three of her own. Uh, there, show, so marrying um, a member of the upper class gave her opportunity to pursue her, her musical interests yeah. clearly. And when she, there is, um, there is evidence, or some very eminent musicologists even think that she premiered four of Mozart's piano concertos after after she had already married to St. Gilgen and she premiered them in Salzburg. Hmm, I've heard that as well. Yeah, yeah, so that's Manfred Hermann Schmidt. So yeah. uh, you can, uh, there's no evidence for that, no hard evidence, but it's a very uh, interesting hypothesis. Uh, what we are sure of is that when she returned from St. Gilgen after her husband had died in 1801, um, she became, uh, she immediately uh, started teaching, mm-hmm. not because she needed it, because, uh, but because she liked to teach mm-hmm. and she wanted to. And she was also soloist in the concerts of Count Ernst von Schwarzenberg. Mm. which were the dominant concerts at that time uh, in Salzburg in the early 19th century. There's a quote where they say, uh, and the most eminent soloist is Maria Anna von Bertolt zu Sonnenburg, Mozart's mm. sister, who traveled um, mm-hmm. widely in Europe when she was a child. Yeah. So, uh, so we definitely know she played. Yeah. And she probably played Mozart's uh, concerts because uh, copies of those concerts went from her uh, estate to St. Peter's Monastery, where they still are. Hmm. So, after her death, or yeah. even before her death. I can't think of the exact letter, but I know there's a letter that I've come across from Wolfgang to Maria Anna detailing the exactly how certain passages in the piano concerto should be played with the yeah. correct uh, ornamentation and articulation right. and things like this. Yeah. So they, clearly she was of a, of a standard. Of course. Yeah. And uh, interesting is also that he always wrote the um, uh, cadenzas for mm-hmm. her. She didn't write her own cadenzas, mm-hmm. which um, is something that uh, strengthened the idea that she didn't see herself as a composer. Right. So, because otherwise she would have done that herself. Mm. And she probably could have done that herself, but mm-hmm. not as well as her brother. <laughs> yeah. And that's why in St. Peter's Monastery in the archive, there are uh, autograph cadenzas by Mozart the from her estate, of course. Uh-huh. And also the piano parts are always in her handwriting. Yeah. yeah. And Wolfgang also wrote pieces for her, dedicated to her. Yeah, yeah, he did. They maintained their relationship. Yeah, and she was always the first. He he sent it to, and he wrote, "What do you think of that?" and mm-hmm. and so on. Yeah. yeah. So it seems that the relationship between Maria Anna and Wolfgang changed in the years leading up to Wolfgang's death. Why is this so? I'm not sure if the relationship uh, went bad or so. I don't think so, actually. Um, there are some sometimes opinions that they kind of quarreled after Leopold Mozart's death, but there's not that much evidence for that. 
they didn't disagree uh, yeah. very much. And she, I mean, how she continued to uh, work for his works and uh, do everything to um, to further his legacy. Yeah. Um, I don't believe she the the relationship went really bad. Yeah. I mean, they may there may have been some misunderstandings, but. Nothing out of the ordinary no, for siblings. No, nothing, yeah. uh, nothing very bad. Mm. So you mentioned earlier that um, when her husband died, she moved back to Salzburg mm -hmm. around 1801. And Constanze, who was Mozart's wife, widow at that time, also lived in Salzburg. Mm -hmm. Did they have a relationship? Yeah, they. well, Constanze came in 1824, okay. so that was pretty late, yeah, so uh, she had lived there for 23 years already in mm -hmm. Salzburg again. Uh, yeah, they visited, and uh, the important thing is that Maria Anna already, before she moved back to St. Gilden, became... Um, a person people asked when they wanted to know about her brother. So in Salzburg, people began to visit her. And the latest ones were the novellos, of course. Uh, they are very famous, but there were lots of others. Mm. And in 1824, Constanze came and what, and with her husband, um, Georg Nicolas Nissen, who was working at that time on a biography of Mozart. And Maria Anna had kept all the family's letters and that's what she gave them. So this biography would not have happened without her and mm -hmm. we would definitely not know as much about Mozart's early life if she wouldn't have told, uh, given the letters mm -hmm. and uh, she also was asked by Breitkopf and Hertel in in 1792 uh, for the necrologue so they wanted to do after Mozart had died they wanted to uh, do a, a piece on him um, Schlichte Groll mm. uh, did a, uh, a written uh, necrologue mm. on him I, I don't know how you call that in English Just obituary o obituary yeah. on him a long one and that was uh, she gave the the informations for that. So we a lot of stories we know from his early days we know from her. So we really have her to thank for yes, this legacy and this wealth of information we have. Of course. Uh, I mean partly Constante of course, but yeah. also Maria Anna Mutter. Yeah. What was the end of her life like? Well, she she had troubles with her eyes, and um, I think she I believe she lost one eye sight on one eye um, around 1820 because uh, her nephew Franz Xaver Mozart visited her in 1822 or so, and he relates that. But the, at that time, she was a very lively lady. Mm -hmm. Later on, she lost sight on her other eye. Eyes around 1825, she um, still kept teaching. She had her students, but she became frailer mm. and she just died of old age in 1829. She died relatively wealthy? Yes, definitely. She was very right. wealthy. Um, her husband had provided her with a pension and also uh, additional funds. So she died a very wealthy lady. So she was teaching because she loved it. Loved she music. was teaching yeah. because, uh, not because she needed the money. Yeah. Definitely not. Yeah. Maria Anna Mozart was a victim of the societal pressures of her era, but the preservation of her brother's work is her lasting legacy. To learn more, visit maria-anna-mozart.at. Thanks, Dr. Neumeyer, for sharing this classical cake with me. You're welcome. Thank you for coming. And thanks to you listeners for tuning in. If you haven't already, please subscribe. If you learned something new, please share with your friends and tell me your reactions in the comments. I'm Daniel Adam Maltz. See you in Vienna. Auf Wiedersehen.